Welcome to another edition of Stay at Home. Uh, this is part eight of a new series from Jacobin, where most days at 6 p.m. Eastern, we'll be uh, talking with a left-wing thinker and then doing a brief Q&A uh, afterwards. And to participate in that Q&A, all you need to do is uh, put a question into the live YouTube uh, chat, and we'll respond uh, to them and, and, and post them to our, our, our speaker. Um, so just as an introduction, because I see a lot of people are still logging on, um, this series is built on the acknowledgement that our politics, socialist politics, is, is about you know, obviously mass rallies and strikes and door knocking and, and the type of organizing that we cannot just do on the internet. But given the coronavirus pandemic, uh, we figured that we would be able to maybe spread, uh, continue our mission of political education but this time do it in a slightly more interactive format. Um, obviously, we're still also publishing uh, seven times a day on the Jack have been uh, website. Um, so today and a few times a week, uh, we're going to host a socialist thinker. Uh, and uh, that thinker will explain an idea for 25 minutes, then we'll take uh, your your questions. And today we have Sabrina Fernandez, who's the editor of Jacobin uh, Brazil. Um, a Jacobin franchise in Brazil that just released um, a really excellent uh, print issue. So I've been told, can't read Portuguese, but many, many people have told me it's good. So I, I'll take them at their word. Uh, but I do know that Sabrina's writing for Jacobin has done an incredible job, um, you know, explaining uh, the Brazilian political context uh, to an international audience, uh, as well as her other work has, has really done a great job popularizing socialist thought to a mainstream audience in Brazil. And before I pass it on to Sabrina though, I just wanted to remind you that tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern, we have Matt Karp talking about the mass politics of the anti-slavery movement of the 1850s and why that movement of the 1850s and 1860s should be remembered as a shining example of what the left can do when it wills together its moral critique of class society with uh, an actual organizational structure and with propaganda and whatever else. So even though it's the 19th century politics, we should think of it in a really modern uh, context. Then at noon on Sunday, we have Grace Blakely, uh, one of my favorite radical economists. She'll be talking with us about the results of the labor leadership election. Does not look particularly bright for the uh, left, but Corbyn has left a legacy that um, should put us in a good position in years to come. So we'll have to see what happens with there. So again, uh, I think I'll pass it off for, to Sabrina Fernandez now. Sabrina will chat for maybe 20, 25 minutes. Then we'll be back for a brief Q&A. But uh, thank you for, for being with us, Sabrina. Thanks for the invite, Bhaskar. Um, it's nice to be here. Uh, when you just said 20, 25 minutes, it actually reminds me of you cutting down all my writing and saying, you're writing too much. You need to be more concise. So it feels like that challenge right now because to talk about Bolsonaro taking over Brazil, we need to go back a little bit. Uh, some people tend to explain Bolsonaro rising as just like the sole merit of the right or basically, well, Lula was arrested, Lula was in prison, so he couldn't get elected, so Bolsonaro won. And things aren't that simple, especially when we look at how many different contradictions that we find both in the right and in the left in this process. So I guess I would have to go back to 2013, uh, we would have to look in, uh, into the exact opposite of the situation right now. So right now we can't go outside. We can't be protesting in the streets, even though we're all going through very difficult situations in our countries, new challenges. But June 2013 was a moment with a lot of protests throughout Brazil, massive protests, uh, mainly in the capitals, but we also uh, saw that in other cities in the country, but those were very contradictory protests. You know, though in the beginning, people were talking about uh, like rising bus, bus fares or uh, things related to other types of social rights. So there was a little bit of like a class content right there. Once these protests started going viral, 
uh, because they went viral online as well, but then on the streets, uh, content changed a little bit. It became more commonsensical content, things in terms of uh, we want more healthcare, we want more education, but what does that mean? What does it mean to have like more healthcare? Like, is it public healthcare for everyone that's free, or is it just well, let's let's let the state invest, including investing in the private healthcare system? So this was a little bit up in the air, and uh, we have a lot of different uh, understandings within the Brazilian left and scholars in general about what June 2013 meant. Uh, I still believe that we are going to see some of the effects in the future. It's not very easy to put June, June 2013 in a tiny little box and just define it. But what we can see is that the right wing was a little bit more prepared to deal with those protests than the organized left. Uh, once there was this lack of strong leadership there, the right was able to mobilize a few types of sentiment and, and meanings uh, that went in their favor. So for example, the idea of like uh, a nationalist Brazil standing up against corruption, this kind of sentiment was very strong, strongly related as well to anti-workers party sentiment because they managed for many years to feed through the media this idea that corruption is associated with the left in Brazil. So this was a, a moment that the right was able to bring in their voices and sometimes even pretend that their voices were disassociated from right-wing movements and parties because there was an anti-party sentiment uh, there as well. And from, from them on, this became a problem because at the same time that there were strong demands coming from the streets, even like social movement in the streets, the Workers' Party had a difficult time handling that. Uh, uh, separating what was actual like class content and we should be listening to this and what was just this uh, anti-corruption fake, anti-corruption stance coming from the right that was able to manipulate the discourse at the time. Uh, from 2013 to 2014, we still had a lot of protests, but they ended up widening down. And by 2014, with the World Cup in Brazil, which was um, a low point for the Workers' Party because uh, you know it was very, people were criticizing the both the repression against the protests, the protests against the World Cup, but also in terms of the how the spending was like the, all the money being spent in things that were not uh, the priorities for the majority of the people in the country. But then we had the elections, and as soon as Juma got reelected, it wasn't easy to reelect Juma. The right was already way stronger. Uh, it also coinc coincided with this economic crisis that was starting to unfold at the time. And then when this happened, the right was already calling for an impeachment. This happened right away, like the like on the day that Juma got reelected. And uh, from then on, uh, we had this challenge, which was uh, defending the Juma government against a potential coup. Uh, but also pressuring the Juma go government not to give in to like these austerity measures, the, the neoliberal uh, stance, because she was also being pressured by the right. And this ended up being one of the, one of the weaknesses of the, pro of the process, because when Juma got elected, re-elected in January, she's already bringing a, like a, a little bit of a, a, a deepening of a neoliberal stance in Brazil. Uh, her finance minister, Joaquin Levy, is an example of that. Maybe she thought she could hold it up and kind of kind of like keep things stable by doing this, but this ended up weakening uh, her trust among the lower classes. And at the same time, it wasn't enough for the right. The right was hungry for more, uh, an econom economic crisis was brooding. So the, the stance for the right was like, Juma is not going to go as far as we need her to, so we need to take it back. This is when the impeachment process became a lot, a lot more strong, uh, more strong. Like we had these yellow and green protests. Uh, we had movements here that were very influenced by movements in the U.S. So like uh, the the Free Brazil movement, uh, which is a liberal conservative movement, uh, quite quite related to the Students for Liberty in the U.S. as well. And then uh, Juma was not calling for you know the leftist base to go to the streets and defend her. Uh, people did go to the streets. We did have social movements uh, calling people to the streets, but Juma wasn't uh, the one pushing for this directly. Uh, this ended, ended up like we, in this parliamentary coup. It wasn't. It wasn't an impeachment in the legal sense of the word. It was a very manipulated process. Uh, she was accused of uh, crimes that she did not commit, 
and then we had a coup and Temer took over. And this is quite important for us, for us to understand the Bolsonaro uh, thing here, because Bolsonaro played a part in the coup. Like he was one of the ones like uh, basically um, complementing uh, these uh, the military dictatorship and complimenting even the fact that Juma was arrested and tortured during the military dictatorship. So he ended up in being this embodiment of this anti-workers party sentiment and this hatred that was very strong against Juma, against Lula. And then we, when we look back to the Tamer, the Tamer process, he played a crucial role to prepare for the Bolsonaro government because he actually cemented austerity in the constitution through these constitutional amendments that basically froze public spending for 20 years. This is what we're dealing with right now. It, it's part of the challenges of de dealing with the pandemic because austerity is basically just like tying our hands. And Bolsonaro doesn't want to do much for it anyway, but it, it even it's even complicated in terms of other kinds of spending that wouldn't go through Bolsonaro directly. But what we see is that during the meantime, Marielle Franco is assassinated as well. So we have this city councilor, uh, like a very strong woman from Rio and her murder is directly tied as well to the Bolsonaro family, uh, either through like the Bolsonaro relation with the militias in Rio or like some other like things that are still being investigated. They're like very close personal relationships with the people responsible for her murder. So there are like some things that uh, we still want to find out about it. This is why uh, it's a very important demand here in Brazil to know who got Marielle killed. And then Lula's arrest is a part of this process as well, because it's not just about the hatred of Lula, but it's how they mobilize this anti-corruption sentiment as this very conservative sentiment about, you know, bringing order to Brazil and reading Brazil of all of these thieves that are supposedly all connected to the Workers' Party in their ideas. And once Lula got arrested, uh, what we know here is that the right was banking on it to try to remove this main opponent from the process. But at the same time, the left was kind of puzzled. Like, what do we do now? Uh, there was this, like, we had a lot of debates right after the arrest in terms of like how to defend Lula from these very, um, this very complicated process that we know that like he was being persecuted. We know there were like a lot of flaws in the process. A lot of the ev evidence wasn't out there yet. You know, some of the evidence we only found out last year, but there weren't big news to us. You know how Moru, the judge involved in the process, acted as a prosecutor. He was very, very involved and very invested in making sure that Lula got a conviction, how the car wash investigation took sides, it wasn't a neutral investigation at all. It was uh, involved in trying to intervene in the elect electoral process. We all kind of like, we knew this from, you know, being political activists and, 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 and social scientists, but we got the evidence directly last year from this. Uh, if, if, like we can even argue like the car wash investigation is basically dead after all of the evidence came out, it came out with the intercept in, uh, over here in Brazil. But one thing that we know is that the left wasn't sure, like do we defend Lula here or like do we like replace him right away? Do we keep him as a candidate? So the workers party opted to keep Lula as a candidate until it was the last minute to switch to Adagi. Uh, when Basker was here in Brazil, like we were in interviewing Adagi and this it was right after Lula got arrested actually. And like, this was still up in the air, um, but they, they took a little bit too long to decide this in my opinion, which kind of hurt uh, the, the chances of like, you know, introducing Adagi to Brazil beyond Sao Paulo. He was quite famous in Sao Paulo, but in other parts of con the country, not so much. And we have leftist fragmentation in Brazil. This is my main area of, of research. And be, due to this, uh, this fragmentation, it wasn't just a matter of having many other leftist candidates, but also like not knowing how to coordinate things in the meantime. We do know that, uh, you know, after the first round, when like second round came on, like most of the left was united against Bolsonaro. It was, this was very much inspired as well by this women's movement, you know, the Eli Non, like not him movement that was very strong, mobilizing against Bolsonaro, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't able to perform a miracle. The Bolsonaro base was really strong. It came from all of these anti-workers' party sentiment uh, from many years ago, but also capital was with him. So all the agribusiness was with Bolsonaro. The financing system was with Bolsonaro. The, the big bourgeois elites in the country with Bolsonaro. 
So it it's really hard to fight things on these terms. So we're very well equipped and we weren't uh, very much because all, all of like these weaknesses of the leftist process and its contradictions in the past. And we know right away that like there was support. Steve, Steve Bannon it, like was involved in the Bolsonaro election. There were like fake news involved in this as well. So, so from the beginning, there was this association between Bolsonaro and Trump, which is something that's not working quite well for Bolsonaro right now because Trump and Bolsonaro seems to be diverging in terms of strategies regarding the pandemic. But I, I can talk about this uh, a little later on. But what we know is like even so, like last year, Lula got released. Um, he's still like com convicted like at a certain level, but he has appeals uh, that he has to go through. And because he hasn't, he hasn't uh, finished going through all of the appeals, he ended up getting released. There was a different understanding in the judiciary that allowed for that. Uh, but it's it's complicated to understand what's going on. Like how, like Lula's making statements that are more progressive uh, in in a certain way, like more progressive than what he defended during his second mandate to be quite honest, but it's still not enough to like actually gain support against Bolsonaro towards a completely like leftist project. What we know right now is that most of the country that's not liberal conservative or like outright fascist, they're not with Bolsonaro right now. So like the, the center right is against Bolsonaro. Uh, even people from Bolsonaro's own old party because he just left to, to found the fascist party right now, Alliance for Brazil. Uh, even those people, like, had, they have been criticizing Bolsonaro, but, like, he's still there. He's still there. The military is still with him. There were some rumors that the military was parting ways with Bolsonaro, but military is still with Bolsonaro, and, the like, the big fundamentalist religious groups, mainly tied to neo-Pentecostal evangelical churches, they, they're still with Bolsonaro, and this means a lot in terms of, uh, you know, holding him there. Also in terms of like the fears that we have that he might like attempt some sort of like self coup to try to uh, retain more powers at this moment. There's a lot of speculation going on about that as well. Uh, what we do know is that, you know, he completely went in like in the direction that we thought he was going go go towards. So austerity measures are very strongly from the beginning. We had this counter uh, counter reform basically for uh, in terms of like a pension, pension counter reform right now. So most people are wondering if they're ever going to be able to retire. Uh, he cut spending across the board for absolutely everything that was related to social rights. Uh, so th this has been quite complicated, but at the same time, criminalization of social movements is on the rise. Uh, his base is constantly creating more fake news against social movement leaders. Uh, indigenous murders are on the rise as well. Uh, so uh, like we have seen a spike in that. We have seen a spike in terms of uh, big landowners just taking over more land illegally. So things are going in a really bad direction. And right now, uh, this means that we're trying to figure out how to handle Bolsonaro and maybe get rid of him uh, when we can't go out in the streets and protest. This is one of the main challenges here in Brazil. So part of the left is torn between asking for an impeachment. We do have enough evidence for real crimes committed by Bolsonaro uh, in terms of just, just the uh, things related to the pandemic as well, like him downplaying the pandemic, going out in the streets and telling people to go out in the streets and ignore the WHO recommendation for, for social isolation. There are many other aspects uh, uh, related to this, investigations around how he got elected, like if there was like a money that wasn't really declared in terms of like spending on the campaign. There are many things related to that, but impeachment is also a little bit of a controversial thing because the last impeachment was a coup. So this is something that gets people a little torn in terms of a strategy. Other people are thinking, well, maybe let's call Bolsonaro to resign. So right now we have like part of PASOL asked for the uh, for like the smaller radical left party. They asked for, for the impeachment of Bolsonaro. Other part of PASOL joined together with the PT and other, uh, other leaders from the leftist camp to ask for Bolsonaro's resignation. But we do know Bolsonaro won't resign. But maybe it's also an attempt to, you know, mobilize things in a different way. You know, we want Bolsonaro out, but we don't want to go in this direction that we depend on Congress. And we do, we know that Congress is kind of split uh, in terms of like being against Bolsonaro, but they could also be, um, they could also shift 
in Bolsonaro support in a second. It all depends on this right wing politics. Congress is quite conservative, conservative, conservative nowadays. So this is one of the, the difficult situations. But the, the pandemic is, is something that calls into question what we can do today in spite of Bolsonaro as well. So I just wanted to play a short clip for you guys of one of the Bolsonaro speeches. Like he's made speeches weekly about the pandemic. And usually when he's making speeches where like people are going out in, this, in, like in their windows and they're just like playing uh, pots and pans and like calling out with Bolsonaro. But uh, things aren't that simple. So I just wanted to play the short clip. It's subtitled for you. No meu caso particular, pelo meu histórico de atleta, caso fosse contaminado pelo vírus, não precisaria me preocupar. Nada sentiria ou seria, quando muito, acometido de uma gripezinha ou resfriadinho. Mas o que tínhamos que conter naquele momento era o pânico, a histeria e, ao mesmo tempo, traçar a estratégia para salvar vidas e evitar o desemprego em massa. Assim fizemos, quase contra tudo e contra todos. Grande parte dos meios de comunicação foram na contramão. Espalharam exatamente a sensação de pavor. O sustento das famílias deve ser preservado. Devemos, sim, voltar à normalidade. Algumas poucas autoridades, estaduais e municipais, devem abandonar o conceito de terra arrasada, a proibição de transportes, o fechamento de comércio e o confinamento em massa. So from, from this, we can tell like a, a couple of things here, like he's, he's very dismissive of the situation. But then this week, he tried to claim, no, the virus is a serious thing. But he's still trying to play this idea that, well, it's either uh, either we try to save people like by saving the economy or things won't work anyway. So he's been going out in the streets here of the federal district where I live. So it's like the capital in Brasilia and just telling people that, no, I'm with you guys. I know you want to work. And if we go through social isolation, then you lose your job. And maybe we're, what we're going to have is like people die anyway, because people are going to be dying of hunger or like because of unemployment and there's depression involved. So he's playing that card, trying to pretend that he actually cares about the employees. When we do know that there are other measures that are being presented by left and right Congress folk about like what, what, how can the government act on this to ensure that we have proper social isolation without letting it get to a point where people are going to be going hungry or they're going to be evicted and things like that. So what I understand from this is that Bolsonaro is still playing fear as a main a main sentiment. So like we we, we see this as a relationship of fear as an effect as an effect of the Bolsonaro era. So instead of mobilizing in, in the sense that other people may be doing, so for example, when we look at Duterte in the Philippines, when he's just telling the police, we know you can, you can shoot people if they break quarantine, you can just shoot people. Bolsonaro is doing a different, a different aspect of this. So instead of going in that direction right away, what he's planning is that no, Congress is not on your side. Like he's being against Congress for a while, right? He even called for protests against Congress. So Congress is not on your side. They don't care about your job. They don't care about your livelihood. I care. So be afraid that they might be uh, pushing for a type of politics that's going to make you lose your job. When in fact, is right, like it's like he has the power to prevent these people from losing their jobs. But what he's doing is quite the opposite. So right now, uh, he's like, uh, he's, he's been like pushing for things, like for example, allowing uh, employees and the employers to negotiate, you know, a reduction 70% of their pay. And like this is quite problematic in many areas, especially when you're looking at how vulnerable people are right now. Or for example, we have an emergency basic income coming out and he's taking a really long time to like release that money and all the process for that money. So that, that's in his hands, but he's pretending it's not, it has nothing to do with him. And he just wants things to go back to normal. And in fact, after Bolsonaro started like doing this thing, we do like there are people noticing that, you know, cities are starting to kind of try to go back to normal, 
which is quite worrisome. Like we were going uh, towards horizontal social isolation and then you no know, more commerce is opening. They're starting to defy things. So this is putting us in a very complicated situation because he continues to be quite dismissive. In fact, he's gone out and said, well, like older people are going to die anyway, but I'm the one trying to prevent more deaths by like helping people keep their jobs. So this is a complicated situation right now. What I do believe is that uh, there are processes in terms of solidarity going through the left right now. So uh, people are doing like crowdfunding campaigns and they're also trying to help to denounce, denounce what companies are breaking, uh, breaking protocol and making people work even though they you know telemarketing companies, for example, that they sh like, they're not even like, Tele they're placing outgoing calls at this moment, like completely useless capitalist outgoing calls trying to like sell people things. And they're keeping 700 workers in a huge space and people are coughing and they're showing symptoms and they're still required to work. So the left is trying to mobilize that way. But at the same time, this thing about how to get rid of Bolsonaro at this moment is a conundrum, especially when we consider who the VP is. The vice president is a military guy. He might look like a more rational guy when compared to Bolsonaro, because Bolsonaro, most of the time, he comes out as a, this buff, buffoonish person, right? So Mourão looks like a more rational guy. But I'm not sure uh, how good it means to have like a very rational military guy in power as well. So there are a lot of variables here, including variables that we don't know how they're going to play themselves out. And we need to be worried about that. But this is a, this is a general overview of the challenges right now. Uh, we do know that like, we can't wait until 2022. Uh, Lula came out when he came out of prison last year. He, he kept talking about why well, Bolsonaro was elected democratically. We must uh, win over him democratically as well, which was quite complicated, like it drew a lot of criticism. One, because we know Steve Bannon tactics were involved in Bolsonaro's election, so it's hard to call this democratic. Uh, also in terms of like, wow, we just wait until 2022 and the new elections and then we get rid of Bolsonaro. How much damage uh, can he actually inflict in the meantime? So there are a lot of challenges uh, there and like I'm open to questions if there are any regarding this as well. All right, well, thanks for that, Sabrina. So by the way, I'm Bhaskar Sankara, the publisher of Jackman. We've been listening to Sabrina Fernandez. Uh, Sabrina is an editor at Jackman Brazil and a longtime contributor to Jacobin. And, oh, it looks like we already have a lot of, of, um, of questions. So while we kind of distill some of those, uh, just a reminder, a few times a week, 6 p.m. Eastern for most of them, uh, Jackman's hosting a social thinker on YouTube to explain an idea, then we have brief Q and A's. Um, all we ask in this time, you know, we're not doing a fundraising drive, we're not doing anything like that. We just want you to press subscribe. And if you enjoyed the videos, you know, share them with your, your friends and comrades. Um, so I guess I'll start with a difficult one. One of the first questions was, um, I guess a big question on the Brazilian left now, which was, was the left too critical of the uh, PT in the years, particularly Lula and Dilma in the years um, um, leading up to Bolsonaro's uh, election, uh, particularly on grounds of corruptions? And, um, you know, how is the left reevaluating that? And I assume the questioner means like, the extra parliamentary left and PSOL and, and uh, other parts, but I'll, I'll let you answer that broad broad question. Yeah, this is a this is an interesting point because uh, I I understand that there's a different types of like anti-PT sentiment. Most most of the anti-PT sentiment comes from the right. But there's some in the left that gets mixed with like proper criticism and you no know, constructive criticism and proper leftist opposition. Uh, everywhere where you're going to have like a, a you know like a leftist government like we we did our issue like issue 25 on the pink tide in Latin America. And this is basically the situation the whole Latin America. During the pink tide, uh, the more radical left was always pressuring the pink tide governments, you know, to break away with capitalism, to try to push for more radical type of reforms. So there was a kind of opposition there. But there, the, I, I understand there was also some type of like anti-workers party sentiment that was 
quite melancholic and he wasn't constructive at, a, at all and kind of just like jumped on the same bandwagon as the right. Uh, when the right was calling for Juma's impeachment, we do know of lefties, radical left organizations, calling for an impeachment as well, either through like just calling for the impeachment or just saying like out with everyone, like we just want to get rid of everyone. Um, when we do, we know that's not the case, right? When this is being mobilized by the right with right wing power, uh, this is not what's going to happen, right? It, like, it's not like they were going to get rid of Juma and put in uh, like a, a direct socialist in power. This is not what was going to happen. So I, I think this contribu uh, contributed a little bit. I don't think it was enough to make the coup happen. Like I wouldn't blame the left on this. Like I would blame the, the proper perpetrators, which is the right wing that mobilized. But I do understand that some of these organizations, they have pushed for like a little bit of a self critique. Like maybe they got too excited about car wash because they do think, you know, standing up against corruption is an important point and Brazilian people care about it. But there are ways of standing up against corruption without falling to falling prey to these like moral panics that come from the right against corruption. Right, and on the broader question of what the left was doing, you know, if the left can't oppose austerity measures or can't support certain corrupt public-private partnerships without engaging in a middle-class anti-corruption rhetoric, but just general leftist critiques of policies the government's in power from the center right to the center uh, left do, then, you know, it's kind of hard to be a parliamentary opposition. Yeah. Uh, you kind of have to fold up and, and just end things by then. Um, so I'll ask the next two questions together because they're kind of related. Um, actually, I'll just ask one now. Um, how do you see Bolsonaro's political future? Could his current political situation uh, meet an end to Brazilian flirtation with neo-fascism and a return to a more centrist neoliberalism? So I guess, what is the future of Brazilian politics after Bolsonaro? If we could be so um, optimistic as to envision that that future. I'm going to try to be very pragmatic uh, in my answer in this, and I think like uh, we're actually going back to the center because the right is trying to go back to the center. The thing that Bolsonaro is quite hard to control, even though the austerity measures like he's being able to implement this, uh, he's always like he's a media problem. Uh, he like goes off script and he does things that end up being contradictory. So even though there's like these. Um, there's part of capital that's still backing up Bolsonaro, like mainly agribusiness and some more like uh, more traditional uh, guys. But like there's like this part of capital that wants a more progressive outlook. They thought like they they maybe went too far on the whole hating women and LGBTQ people and indigenous people and black people. They think no, Bolsonaro is pushing too far on that. So we want like a more uh, like. Maybe it's a little bit of a, the Nancy Fraser, uh, Nancy Fraser understanding of it. So like progressive neoliberalism, there's part of the, the right that's looking in that direction right now. So I think we may be going back to center. I'm not sure how electable Bolsonaro will be in two years. Though we need to understand that in the fake news era, things are very unpredictable. Like when once we're monitoring some of these WhatsApp groups in Brazil, we see how hard it is to actually argue uh, with people when they're being blinded by punitivism and this kind of discourse. But there's a question here as well, right? Like, are we moving back to a center right or does a center left uh, have a chance? Uh, how can those of us mobilizing the more radical left side help to like, you know, move this pendulum, pendulum uh, a, a little bit more to the left? So I would say like, the, maybe the fight here is something between Luciano Huki, who's uh, this like, progressive neoliberal guy comes from TV, uh, seems to be like, uh, you know, I'm very charitable, but at the same time, his own businesses are laying people off at the moment. Or someone more in the sense in terms of like Flavio Gino with uh, PC Dubé. Uh, they have communists in the name, but that's debatable whether PC Dubé is actually communist. That's, that's debatable. There are communist people in there. I know that. But uh, the party in itself, I put it in a moderate left uh, with Flavio Gino or even Ciro Gomes, who was a very strong name in the elections uh, uh, in 2018. Uh, we do question like the this is something like would Ciro have like would Ciro have beat Bolsonaro? This is one of the questions. There were there was polling involved around that, but at the same time, the left was more organized around the Workers Party because the Workers Party had the stronger base. So like there are questions like would Ciro beat Bolsonaro because Ciro was not PT 
and people just hated the PT more than anything. So that's why they voted against the PT. And Ciro Gomez is still a very, very strong name. So uh, like if we move back to the center, I think this is part of the debate right now. You know, so like these like younger, um, more progressive looking center, but still very much based on neoliberalism or the center left that has its own contradictions, but doesn't look radical enough in order to scare people away. Obviously, I will try to push for a different alternative. I will try to push for a socialist alternative that I think that is much more effective at defeating the right here. But if I was to give a pragmatic answer, I would say that the socialist left in Brazil is not at this moment prepared for this. So we may be seeing a push to the left, or to the center, right? To the left, but in terms of stopping at the center. Right. So the next two questions I'll actually group together. So one is about the recent relationship between the big media and Bolsonaro, especially global. Uh, then there's been a couple questions about the role of evangelical churches. So one um, listener, viewer, uh, asks, were Brazilian evangelical churches always involved in politics? When did they begin to have a weight that could influence elections? What are the social sectors in which they are most influential? So I'll give you those two questions on to the, the basis of support, the, the media question and then the question of evangelical churches. Yeah, Bolsonaro kind of played the same script as Trump in terms of like going after the media and saying, you know, like the media lies, the press is always lying about me. You can only trust me when I say it. So like his Twitter account is basically like the official way of communicating. So this is very similar to the US in that sense. But at the same time, he also kind of authorized particular outlets. So for a while it was a stat down. They're like, there are particular journalists that Bolsonaro is saying, yeah, this is okay. But he's all, always attacking journalists. You know, like sometimes he's attacking, uh, attacking female journalists in a very misog misogynistic way. So there are like certain situations that you do see like there's a battle going on right now. Uh, global, um, global was part of the push for the coup against Juma. Uh, global was involved in the military dictatorship. So like global is directly involved with huge capitalist interests in Brazil. Uh, they're not on our side, but at the same time, they, they seem to be kind of sick of Bolsonaro. There's an antagonism between global and Bolsonaro right now. You see this when we watch like the evening news, like Jornal Nacional, we see this tension brooding, but I'm very um, skeptical to go to the point of just saying that, oh no, so like global is on our side. I don't think this is the situation at all. We shouldn't be trusting bourgeois media at all. They have their own interests. Sometimes it coincides with us just a little bit, but they might be playing completely different cards. Uh, what we do know is that um, Bolsonaro has managed to kind of disavow journalism in Brazil a little bit to the point that when we were like in the second round and we were making a campaign, you know, like, and be like, please don't vote for Bolsonaro. And people would just be saying things like, no, but that's not true. And it's like, oh, prove, prove it to me. And then we would show like something in the media. It's like, that's not true. Bolsonaro tells me that the media lies. And then they, they, this makes things quite complicated. So I like that you said bourgeois media because that's a sign of the superior political development of the Brazilian uh, left compared to the US left. Because here at best, like you mostly get critiques of the, you know, the mainstream media. Uh, then if you're really with a hardened, you know, um, fellow traveler on the left, you get like corporate media, but there's not too many denunciations of the capitalist or bourgeois press anymore. We've, uh, we've this is an interesting uh, thing about Brazil, like the left here in general, and I'm not talking just about the socialist left, but I do see this in the more moderate center left as well. Uh, people like, like to hold on to like the proper names of things. So like, I, I get happy about this, being able to use this. Well, it's funny, like when I visited Brazil, I was witnessing what felt for a lot of Brazilians, like the low point of their left and looking around, it just seemed like it was so much deeper rooted and so much more connected with mass social movements and unions and political parties than anything we have here. And obviously a very similar thing in, in India where the, the right wing has also taken power, but at least there's still millions of people organized in front organizations and mass organizations. You still have a communist party with a million members and whatever, whatever else there. But, um, okay, so the next question that we have here is, 
Um, could you comment? On oh, the religious that? thing. I didn't mean, I didn't talk about oh, that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Go, go. Sure. Yeah. I just I just answered the first one. Uh, there's a so. The religious leaders have been involved in politics for a while in Brazil. Uh, we, it's important for us to separate things. For example, in the beginning when the Workers' Party was founded, so, uh, you know, that period after the military dictatorship and like going to this like democratic period in Brazil, uh, like, the, like there was a type of theology, it was called a like liberation theology, that was very strong. And so like very much based on like emancipation through, through the Catholic Church, so the Brazilian left is quite rooted in progressive religious stances, um, but neo-Pentecostal stances are a little bit more recent. Uh, they got stronger through televangelists and then radio evangelists and then YouTube evangelists, like they're everywhere nowadays. Uh, they have this like prosperity gospel. Uh, so this is something that worries us. Uh, one of the biggest uh, television networks in Brazil, Record, is owned by, by one of these churches. So they're quite influential and they were influential even in the past. Like, uh, for example, when uh, Universal, which is one of these biggest churches, and you can find them throughout Latin America, like tiny little towns in Colombia, there's a Universal church there. And then when they, they kind of like, they did this huge launch party for the, one of their temples and Juma was invited. And then she said something about, you know, like God being the Lord of Brazil, something like this. I don't remember the words specifically. Um, there was pressure uh, against her government, for example, to make a stance against abortion rights. Abortion rights are not legal in Brazil. Uh, this has been like a, a really uh, long, like long going stance of the feminist movement. And Juma ended up like backtracking on her abortion stance because of this kind of pressure. So they, they have been influencing politics for a while, but nothing at, this, at the level that it is today. In the sense like Bolsonaro goes in their play, like in their churches and he says things and then the Bolsonaro brings them to his own uh, spaces as well. So like the connection between these churches, these fundamentalist religious positions and the Bolsonaro government is the strongest it's ever been. And one example of this is the Damaris government or the Damaris ministry, right? So we have a minister in Brazil who's responsible for human rights but she actually doesn't care at all. She comes from this pastor background, uh, very anti-feminist. So uh, this is one of the challenges right now. Um, so I guess one, one more question that came in is, could you comment on Bolsonaro's uh, election has influenced Brazil's foreign uh, policy? So obviously you're seeing lots of, um, I guess, friendly approaches to the US, which can be expected of any right-wing administration in Latin America. But what, what else are you seeing from Brazil's foreign, foreign policy? Uh, last year, we ran this piece on Jacobin by Andrea Pagliarini called The Worst Diplomat in the World, right? Uh, it's, about, <laughs> it's about Ernesto Araújo. So this is available in English and also available in Portuguese on the Jacobin Brazil uh, website. And uh, Ernesto Araújo is our like, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and he's just terrible. He's uh, he's like uh, involved with uh, climate denialist. Uh, he's involved with uh, very weird uh, conspiracy theories around like cultural Marxism, things like that. Um, not very diplomatic at all. So like you guys can take a look at that. It's a really good read. Uh, but in in a sense, what we see is that. Um, the relationship with Israel should be mentioned here. This is the first time uh, that uh, Brazilian government has been so connected to Netanyahu. Uh, Netanyahu uh, was here and like these fundamentalist churches are very uh, Zionist in a certain way. And at the same time, the Bolsonaro government is based on a lot of like anti-Semitic feelings. So this is one of the really complicated contradictions coming out uh, uh, over there. Uh, we do know that there's involvement uh, of, between the Bolsonaro government and the Bolivian coup. So against Evo Morales, uh, they've been quite connected. Uh, last year, we also had the situation um, when I believe this was last year. Now, like nowadays, we're losing track of time, but it was last year. Uh, yes, because it was right after the coup in Bolivia when these guys kind of just invaded the Venezuelan embassy here in Brasilia. And they were like connected to Guaidó, 
and they just invaded and the Bolsonaro government wasn't willing to do anything to, you know, secure the embassy. So basically all of the militants, we had to go there and like kind of make a fuss about it that it can just go invading embassies. And this is one of the situations. So they're very uh, pro Guaido, pro the coup in Bolivia. They were very disappointed about what just happened in Argentina. Uh, they stay connected to Piñera. So in terms of like what we, ha what we had in Latin America is this switch in general. So from the pink tide to like conservative, like neoliberal governments popping up here and there. And Bolsonaro is quite connected to all of those. We do have this uh, ongoing diplomatic crisis with China. Uh, this has been since the beginning. So once Bolsonaro got elected, his party sent people to China to secure trade deals. So uh, very pragmatic in the sense. And then just like uh, two weeks ago, uh, the like one of Bolsonaro's sons and Bolsonaro's sons are usually saying things that pull, puts the Bolsonaro government in like complicated situations over the internet uh, against the like the Chinese government and Chinese people. So uh, there are conflicts every now and then, and usually uh, it takes a while for them to go over. But like the the relationship to Trump is is very strong, and the situation with Netanyahu, we do see like a strong partnership there as well. Okay, so there's too many questions. So I think we'll have to just wrap it up with uh, a broad, I'll, I'll try to I, I, like meld together some questions on strategy. Um, so one, people are asking about what happens next to Lula? Will he be able to challenge the law that's barring him from running again for office? And I guess related to that, what's gonna happen to the PK? Uh, then there's a broader question of, is there an alternative project inside the Brazilian left aside from KK that has any possibility of winning influence? Um, so I guess, what's the future of PASOL and the social movement? So I know those are very big questions. So any thoughts I guess you have on, on, on strategy and the way forward, um, or maybe even just posing some of the, the questions that are facing the uh, Brazilian left going, going forward, I think would be uh, useful for the readers. Yeah, I'm very critical of Lula's tactic of class conciliation. That that has been kind of a theme in my writing around Lula. As much as I, I think uh, he did a really great job in terms of social policies in Brazil, lifting people out of poverty. There were some contradictions that I wish he would fix, and we have seen some recent self critique uh, coming from him, like even things related to the environment, which is. Uh, quite a strong point because uh, they had some contradictory policies there as well, like these mega projects. Uh, but right now I have this feeling and these here is a bit me, like me just speculating uh, about this because we will have to ask Lula directly about this. We haven't gotten a chance to interview him yet here uh, at Jacobin. But the thing uh, with Lula is that he might also be scared of pushing things a little bit too much and being sent back to prison or them just trying to speed up all of his appeals uh, to try to convict him like, you know, like uh, any chance that they get right away. So I think he's trying to play it a little bit safe. Um, we still have to figure out how strong the, like how the judiciary will position itself around this. The judiciary, we, we say there's a lot of like uh, ju judiciary activism in Brazil uh, they kind of just like decide things and it sometimes it's hard to figure out in which direction they're going to go. And this is part of this is part of the pro problem right now because Lula still has this discharge like like just hanging over his head and that makes things a little bit complicated. At the same time, there's a push for the left to try to you know overcome the Lula paradigm. Like, should we just be uh, connected to Lula about everything and everything that we do depends on what Lula does, on whether Lula is going to run in 2022? Like, should we be positing alternatives that go beyond Lula? And this is a question that's very active in the center left. So things around, you know, the Flavio Gino, uh, who who's part of like Lula's base with PCdoB uh, is related to that. Ciro Gomes is very, very crit critical of Lula and the PT, any chance that he gets. Uh, and like the PSOL is something that um, I have been studying the radical left very closely for a really long time now. And like, what I see in the radical left, most of the times, a lot of potential. So whenever I write about this, I give like the stance of the moderate left and like 
what the radical left should be doing, could be doing, or, uh, is there room to grow over here and there? But I do think like radical left is still very minor in this, in this short term. Uh, maybe in 10 years, or maybe if we're able to mobilize like a big wage come out of this, like I've been talking to like, like other Green New Dealers and like uh, as an eco-socialist myself, trying to bring in discussions about like, how can something like with the different names, something that's more connected to Brazil, but in the same page, help to mobilize Brazil like out like away from the economic crisis and the pandemic crisis that's that's arising as well um pushing a more direction like in the direction that helps to like stronger public services how can we do this maybe if the radical left uh jumps on this kind of program that can actually like rally the masses and like i would hope that something like this would rally the masses in brazil it might gain a little bit more protagonism but at this point, it's still very much this game between like Lula and Ciro and sometimes Flavio Gino jumping in and there. Like Guilherme Boulos, uh, who was the candidate for PSOL in 2018, he's quite well respected within the leftist circles. Is like uh, there's a video of, of Basker interviewing him. So you uh, guys can see him here on the Jacobin Magazine YouTube channel. I'm a YouTuber, guys. So I do this thing of like connecting, just watch this, subscribe and things like this. Um, and like Guilherme Bowles is a strong name, but it's still quite marginal in the sense of like, you know, reaching out in terms of like national leadership. There's still a, a lot of work for the radical left to make a difference and maybe create the movement. Like I don't see it like uh, in the near future, a movement strong as was the movement for Bernie in the US. And this is something uh, that also may, puts us in, in question, you know, like, in, like when we look at Venezuela and all of the contradictions around Maduro, um, there they do have a lot of like people who are affiliated to the party but they're not just members of the party they're militants and they're doing like work every day and that culture in brazil needs to grow a lot more before we can like we can like say okay we have like a real strong radical alternative and it has potential for the next two years i don't see that yet though i'm hoping for it and like helping to build it any way i can all right, so we just listened to Sabrina Fernandez. Uh, she's the editor of, of Jack in Brazil. And she's also a prolific YouTuber, so we'll link to her channel as well. And Sabrina is one of the few leftists really using the venue well and winning ground from the right and uh, marrying a um, orthodoxy in a good way, you know, a commitment to core left-wing values, but the ability to translate it into the mainstream. And obviously that's what we try to do at Jack in as well. So please subscribe to this channel and share the video if you liked it. And tomorrow we have uh, Matt Karp on how it took a mass movement to end US slavery. On Sunday, we have Grace Blakely on the future of the UK Labor Party after uh, Corbyn. Um, so lots of great material. All we ask for you is to press subscribe. And uh, thanks to Kale Brooks who's doing production work kind of behind the scenes and to Sabrina as well. Um, and I hope everyone has a great weekend. And uh, thanks again. Thanks.